All right. Uh, we need to get this done so I can go have some lunch. Let's look at some of the questions we have today. Here we go. It says 28. We'll see what I answer. PFTPM Posse, you mentioned that you think a good player defense in a gambling policy situation could be I wasn't properly educated on the policy, but how would that work in the NFL secret rig kangaroo court based on what we know it wouldn't work? And you're absolutely right. It's one of the reasons why when the NFL approaches players with news that, number one, you violated the gambling policy, and number two, here is the suspension that we're going to impose upon you, and then number three is if you fight it, it's going to be worse. Every one of these suspensions, going back to Calvin Ridley in 2021, happened through negotiation between the league and the union. And how much negotiation can there be when the player has no leverage? There's no evidence presented. There's no proof presented. The NFL has put through no steps to show that the player actually did it or that the player was properly educated. No, we have you. You're busted. And if you fight it, it's only going to be worse. And everybody has cried uncle. So... That's the problem with a policy that was not the product of collective bargaining that has an ineffective dispute resolution program that gives the commissioner full power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what the penalty is going to be. They've got the hammer, and they're not afraid to use it. And for non-players, it's even worse. For non-players, they're basically told, pack your things and go. No questions asked. That's, that's another angle that we've been delving into, just to show how the NFL is trying to walk this tightrope between gimme, 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 when it comes to sports book money and get the hell out of here when it comes to somebody who may have just participated in a March Madness bracket for money. That's enough to get you fired if you're a non-player in the NFL. PFTP and Posse, should I answer this one? What was the reason we were given for not being invited to the gambling conference call? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's no surprise. I, what happened was, and, and we've been one of the only ones who have been banging the drum about potential inadequacies in the NFL's gambling education efforts as it relates to players and some of the mixed messages out there and some of the things that have been said on TV or elsewhere that just don't make sense and contribute to fan confusion as to the gambling policy. So I started seeing tweets on Tuesday about things that a compliance officer was saying and the new six rules of the things that players can't do and when you start seeing it pop up from several different reporters, it's like, did they have a conference call and they didn't tell us? Because we usually get invited to pretty much every one of these, even the ones that are for a select few. We get invited. Maybe not now. Uh, so I started poking around and I decided, you know, when, in a situation like this, I, I will go directly to the people responsible for it. I won't complain over their head like some would do with me. I go directly to them and I say, what's going on here? What happened? And, and I was told basically in a nutshell You've been asking questions about the gambling policy. We've been providing you information. We basically decided you didn't need to be involved in this, which is ludicrous, frankly. I mean, it's a great spin. I credit them for coming up with a way to try to semi-plausibly thread the needle. Well, you know, you've been asking a lot of questions. We've been giving you a lot of answers. So we're going to have this open on the record conference call. And you don't need to be one of the ears on the line and potential voices asking questions because you've been taken care of separately. It's ludicrous when you think about it. And, and I've... I've <laughs> I've considered in some of the other emails I send on other topics being extra snarky and saying, you know, if I'm asking you for comment on Tyree Kill, I'm not waiving my privilege to be invited to any conference calls you might have about Tyree Kill in the future. So that's the explanation we were given. And and what's happened here is, and I, and I think I think what's gone on, there's a couple of different wings of the broader PR function. One is one that I've been asking questions of. Another decided to affirmatively reach out and provide us with information because they they realized we were covering this and they may not have appreciated the way we were saying some of the things we were saying. And then they gave us information and I spotted some flaws in that information. And we kind of went back and forth. And I don't think they appreciated the fact that we pointed out some of the flaws in the information that they had given us. So I I, I think that at the end of the day, Whoever set this thing up just didn't want us on it because there was a concern that, you know, I might ask somebody a question that they don't want to be asked or that they can't answer in an acceptable way. And the one question I would have asked is I've written a PFT a couple of times. Why in the world do you let non-players gamble on sports other than football when they're not at work? And for any non-player, they're not allowed to bet on anything, anytime, any place. Can you explain that to me, especially when you have 
full and complete power to determine the contours of the gambling policy because it's not collectively bargained. Why are you giving the players this right? None of them, none of them are going to say, you know what, I'll choose not to play in the NFL because it's really important to me to be able to put a little money on the Yankees against the Red Sox. It's, it's created and contributed to so much of the confusion that we now have because the NFL decided to give this benefit to the players. And as somebody said to me last week, when in the hell does the NFL ever do anything that counts as a favor to the players? It all goes back to the Chris Sims conspiracy theory, which the more people I talk to about it, the more say, you know what? It's really not a conspiracy theory. It's probably just fact. The sports books want young, rich guys to piss away money in gambling. They're the whales they're trying to catch. They're the guys who are going to lose money. We reported last week somebody in the league lost $8 million last year gambling. Sports books want that. That's why they're allowed to do it. And that's the, the theory that we're going to accept as fact, unless and until someone from the NFL explains to me why players are allowed to bet on other sports and non-players aren't. All right. I should just end it now. I, I need a nap after that. Hurricane Dave. He's got a few questions. My God, how many has he got here? Are you still confident that Mahomes' contract situation will be remedied before the season? Look, I was told weeks ago that before the season begins, he will once again be the highest paid player in the NFL. And I know he said it's not about money. It's about championships and yada, yada. Well, look, when he got his most recent contract three years ago, it jumped the highest paid player in the NFL by $10 million a year. And now he's been jumped by $7 million a year, by players who aren't in his same category. All due respect to Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson, you're not Patrick Mahomes. You're not the two-time MVP. You're not the two-time Super Bowl MVP. You haven't been to the Super Bowl three times. Those guys haven't been to the Super Bowl one time. Well, Hurts has, but you get my point. Lamar Jackson currently at $52 million per year is a one-time NFL MVP from four years ago. That's that's it. And it's nothing to, to, to sneeze at. All I'm saying is most reasonable people and even some unreasonable people would conclude that Patrick Mahomes should be making more than Lamar Jackson. And, and now that Hertz is making $6 million per year more than Patrick Mahomes, and Patrick Mahomes just beat him in the Super Bowl, you, you would think that this is going to get rectified. So I still think it's going to get remedied before the season starts. I think the Chiefs would love not to be able to do it, but I think the Chiefs recognize at some point it just looks too bad on them, and it looks bad on him. It looks bad on him to not be, not be paid what he properly should be paid. It makes him look like he is being taken advantage of. It makes him look like a sucker. And I don't like it when the best player in football, who should be making more money than anyone else, is so woefully underpaid to the point where there's a risk that he's going to look like a sucker. Uh, all right, let's see. What do we have here? Um, people ask me about people ask me about who I'm targeting for my fantasy team this year, and I just don't. I I, th I think that they're trying to set me up to 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 respond by saying we don't give a shit because nobody does. Um, Jeremy Dodd, do you see a situation where all of the running backs in the league would do some sort of a strike, like not attending training camp? I realize they know they'll get fined, but what's the team to do? Start training receivers to pass block. Somebody suggested that to me last week because, yeah. Look, I believe that the running backs should come together and create their own bargaining unit. There was an effort to do that four years ago. I don't know whatever happened with it. It wouldn't be easy to do. The union would fight against it. The league would fight against it. But I think it's only fair for the running backs to have their own voice to represent and advocate their unique interests when it comes to how they get paid, when they get paid, what they get paid. And somebody I was talking to last week said, yeah, they should all hold out. Well, first of all, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They're not going to all hold out. Maybe you could get the best of the best to hold out, but, but what does it prove? They get fined. For guys on their second contracts, those fines can no longer be waived. What does it prove? What are you going to get from it? You're not going to get anything from it other than a significant bill that you're going to have to pay. Now, it was then suggested that maybe they should just threaten to hold out, and that would get coverage of the possibility and bring attention to the issue between now and the start of training camp. And I, I can live with that. But if they don't really intend to hold out, I don't know. How much attention does it really generate? I mean, maybe, maybe, it, hey, it's a quiet time. 
maybe if there's some huffing and puffing, even if they're not going to blow the house down, we cover the huffing and the puffing and we bring more attention to the issue. It seems like others are are cognizant now of the unfairness of the current system for running backs, whether it's the contracts they sign, the fact that they are are being paid very little during the years where they're doing a lot. Maybe they should have a quicker path to free agency. Maybe there should be a league-wide fund that pays them as they go. Whatever it is, we need to do something to make the system more fair to the uh, the running backs in the National Football League. Lee Dale UK, hello from the UK, and a fellow AOL user, you and Sims have talked about the depth of the AFC a lot. Which of any AFC teams have almost no playoff chance would have a shot in the NFC? The Texans? And which NFC contenders would have no chance in the AFC? I think the Texans would... If you put them in the NFC South, the Texans would would have a better shot than they have in the AFC. I think the only team in the AFC this year that truly has no shot is the Texans, which means, and maybe the Raiders, which means both will probably make the playoffs. Last year, I said the Jaguars, Jets, and one other team had no shot, and the Texans. And the Jaguars made it, and the Jets were alive for a while. And the year before... We did the draft on PFT Live or PFT PM about the teams that have no shot of making the playoffs league-wide. I picked the Bengals and they went to the Super Bowl. So I'm out of the business of flagging the teams that have no shot. But in the NFC, look at some of the teams in the NFC. You would drop into the AFC and they would just sink like a stone. A lot of the teams, really, other than the Eagles and 49ers, a lot of those other teams... Uh, the Cowboys, I think, would be viable. The Giants would probably have a chance. The Vikings would be 7-10 and 10 and maybe alive the last two weeks of the season. Maybe not. Most of the teams in the NFC, though, you throw them in the AFC and they are done. That's why I think this year, and whether this is the Seahawks or the Vikings or the Lions or the Saints, the Eagles and the 49ers are the two best teams in the NFC. And both of those teams would have a pretty good shot against the AFC champion. But it doesn't take much to throw a team off. Injuries, ineffectiveness, a couple of bad losses. All of a sudden, they got to go on the road in the playoffs. If the Eagles and the 49ers or both of them wobble, it opens the door for one of these other NFC teams to slip through. But the problem is, for one of those other teams, they slip through and they come up against the Chiefs, the Bengals, the Bills, the Ravens. They're done. They're done. You would need a team to slip through from that AFC field if you're going to be one of the teams that slips through from the NFC field. But it still is. It still is. We're not handing the trophy to anybody. It still is wide open, but the AFC has a cluster of great teams, and they're going to be teams that don't make it to the playoffs in the AFC that if they had gotten in, if they had gotten a seat at the table, they'd be good enough to run the table and win the Super Bowl. All right, let's see what else. What? <laughs> Robert, why is it called PFTPM if you tape it in the morning? Well, you get it in the afternoon, Robert. It comes out in the PM, and it's always been PFTPM. So the earlier I tape it, the more likely it is to be available to you at some point after 12 o'clock Eastern. I hope that answers your question. Troy Walters, will Tyreek get the Ezekiel treatment from the NFL, even without a conviction? Do you think he will receive a suspension for violating the personal conduct policy? Do you think the NFL is indicating they will respond by their latest statement on this? Well, the NFL has no statement officially. They've said no comment, but it's the NFL's website that has the statement that the NFL sought through NFL media from the Miami-Dade Police Department that the investigation against Tyreek Hill is still ongoing. Here's the thing about the personal conduct policy. Once a guy gets himself in any type of controversy, the league can basically do whatever it wants. It can be as aggressive as it wants. It can be as inclined as it wants to look the other way. There's surveillance video out there. There's a alleged victim out there who intends to press charges. If the NFL wants to track this down, it can. That's one of the problems I have with the personal conduct policy. There's too much discretion in the enforcement of it. Here's a question from fantasy every day. And this question I think has been coming every day, so I may as well answer it. I don't really have a good answer for it. The question is, what is your favorite and least favorite part of running PFT? I I don't, I mean, I don't have a favorite or least favorite part. I love what I do. It beats working for a living. I enjoy 
waking up in the morning and seeing what's going on in the NFL and writing stories with my own thoughts about it, doing some original reporting. And we actually do more original reporting than a lot of the haters out there would suggest, but keeping a finger on the pulse of the NFL, having influence over it, causing a little trouble from time to time, good trouble, not causing trouble gratuitously, but trying to force the game that I've loved for 50 years to change. You know, I've said this for from time to time. I, I was indoctrinated by the NFL films, Voice of John Pacenda, the slow motion, snow fluttering to the ground, the ball spiraling, but just wobbling a little bit in the air. Everything about it, it caused me to put the NFL on a pedestal that I now try to force the NFL, the National Football League, 345 Park Avenue, everyone who works there to live up to that standard. The game needs to live up to the standard that lured me to it 50 years ago. So I like being part of it. I like interacting with folks. I like providing people a distraction and a diversion from whatever stuff they're dealing with day to day. That's how I've come to terms with the fact that I really don't contribute jack diddly squat to society other than to, to give you something you can listen to, you can read, you can spend time on that is different from the stuff that you have to deal with that you'd rather not deal with. The best part for me is there are limited things in my life that I have to deal with that I don't want to deal with because my job is something that I enjoy doing every single day. Let's see what else we have here. There's a, I, I, I'm afraid that some of these are going to cause me to have too long of an answer. If there's something you really want to have answered that you've asked today that I haven't answered, try tomorrow and maybe we'll get into it. Um, John Richardson asks about a potential Devontae Adams suspension. Remember, he he pushed in plain sight the ESPN staff worker down to the ground, and there's still some pending something over that in the NFL. Could could impose discipline under the personal conduct policy, but the NFL has developed a habit post Ray Rice of waiting until the criminal process is completely ended before the NFL does anything. But that's still potentially out there. But you know, the baseline suspension for Assault is six games and it can go up and it can go down. So six would be the baseline, but you know, we saw it. It wasn't egregious. Would it be less than that? I don't know, but it is something to keep an eye on as uh, time goes by. And as presumably the formal legal process comes to a conclusion, JC Carm, who is your favorite broadcast team? Pat Summerall and Tom Brookshire is my favorite broadcast team because when i was a kid and we had very few games that we could watch on tv the one that summerall and brookshire did was guaranteed to be a great game it made that game feel bigger that was how i knew the nfl regarded it as a big game because those two were assigned that was the the crew when i was growing up and i know that the other networks had their crews and monday night football was a unique experience but but for me one of the ways when I was a kid and I didn't understand much about the NFL, still don't, to figure out how how the, the wind's blowing, Summerall and Brookshire. And, and today, I agree with something James Brown said last year. People aren't watching games because of who the broadcast crew is. They may turn a game off because of the broadcast crew, but nobody's saying, well, I have to watch this game because it's this crew. Uh, I, the, the game is what draws people in. And you want to have a crew that is good enough to do the game justice. The game is what draws people in. Jaybird042069, are you going to retake your view on the Vikings future quarterback view since Jefferson may have a way out after this year? I don't think he has a way out of, after this year. I think he may want out after this year if they don't pay him. My take on the Vikings quarterback situation is very simple. Very simple. The Vikings want an upgrade over Kirk Cousins. Because the Vikings believed that Kirk Cousins was their franchise guy, the long-term answer at the position. There's no way in hell he would be entering the final year of his contract with the Vikings having no way to hold him in Minnesota after this season. There is no way they would allow that to happen if they thought he was a franchise guy. They want a franchise guy. They're going to get a franchise guy eventually. Maybe they won't. I don't know. It's been 40-plus years since they had Fran Tarkton. But Justin Jefferson's status has nothing to do with that. I don't know if they're just looking to save some money in the short term. I don't know what they're looking to do. They're just doing it because they can, because he's a nice guy and he's not causing any stink. So let's just not pay him until he's causing a stink. If it causes a stink, then we'll take care of it. I don't know what they're doing, but my point that I made earlier 
in the program is they could end up regretting. Jimmy, AKA JL Jones 117. What would it take for you to partake in some psychedelics during your time off? I have no interest in ever doing any type of psychedelics because I'm concerned that under the wrong circumstances, with the wrong substance, the wrong time, it can end up causing permanent damage that I would not even be aware has happened. So I have no interest in psychedelics. I have no need to find some spiritual awakening. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know where I am. I accept reality. I don't need any, any help in that regard. I don't need to have mind-altering experiences to have any sort of, of true meaning in what it is that I do. I really did think it was interesting, though, to hear Aaron Rodgers say at the psychedelics conference yesterday that when he won the Super Bowl for the first time, that was when his spiritual journey began because his attitude was, I've done everything that I set out to do. Now what? Now what? And look, he hasn't been back to a Super Bowl since then. So one of the things that I think wires a guy for sustained greatness in the NFL is to never ask that question. You have to be robotic like Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes. Climb the top of the mountain. Got the ring. Now what? Go get another. Now what? Go get another. Now what? Go get another. And don't think about it. We don't have time for your spiritual journey. We don't have time for your self-reflection. We don't have time for your navel gazing. We don't have time for your, your kooky notion that the word is spelling because words can cast a spell or whatever that quote is that he uttered yesterday. And yes, I had to listen to it three times to make sure it was him and to make sure that I heard it correctly because it is a little bit... It's a little out there, but that's okay. He's a great quarterback. But the more he talks, the more I understand why he only ever won one Super Bowl. I think it stopped being a priority to him. He's the dog that caught the car. He finally caught the car. Instead of going and trying to catch another car, his, his attitude changed just enough, just enough to remove that edge that's necessary to catch more cars. Brady never lost that edge. Mahomes isn't losing that edge. And maybe that's why Aaron Rodgers has only one Super Bowl win for his career. And really, something that could be a common fact between him and Brett Favre. Maybe Favre lost his edge once he finally climbed the mountain and grabbed the ring and did the thing that he set out to do his whole life. Maybe for some guys, one's enough. All I want is one. Yeah, you know, I've, I've wondered from time to time, because I got into this business because you know, I was spending a lot of time following the NFL anyway. I've enjoyed it for years. But you know what? If the Vikings had won a Super Bowl in the 70s, maybe I wouldn't be in this business. Maybe I'd be covering a different sport or doing something else entirely. I don't have this same zeal for baseball because, hey, the Pirates won a World Series when I was a Pirates fan in the 70s. Check that box. Hill is climbed. I don't know, maybe I got something more in common with Aaron Rodgers than either Aaron or I would ever care to admit. Although I've said before, I think Aaron Rodgers and I have a lot in common. And I think we'd have some good conversations. He just probably wouldn't want to be in the same room with me because on the things we disagree, I'm not going to pull punches. I'm going to tell him I disagree. And I don't think he likes being around people who tell him I disagree with you. And here's why. I need to go. Here's why. I have a radio spot in Chicago in five minutes. So that's it for today's PFTPM. Thank you, as always, for some of your time. Macy, is Macy still here? Where is Macy? She's still back there. See her? See her? Say hi, Macy. Come on. Come on. Speak. Hi. There she is. Hi. You want to say hi? You want to you bark? You want to do anything? You just want me to shut up? You want to go outside? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to go outside? She wants to go outside. All right. See you next time. Bye. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.